to, likes the King James Version, and there's nothing wrong with the King, nothing wrong with the King James Version, okay? Um, the, uh, the issues are more related to um, the King James Version is an older version which relied upon a, a collection of manuscripts that we've got newer, or more recent manuscripts for. Maybe you've noticed in some of the passages in the Bible, like the woman caught in the act of adultery or the ending of Mark, it says these do not appear in the earlier manuscripts. Well, that's because we found more recent manuscripts. And so your, your newer translations, like NIV or New American Standard Version or English Standard Version, ESV, some of these that are out there, they're always going to use the more recent manuscripts, and that's where it's helpful. Um, but, no, you, if, if you're used to reading a particular version and it's inspiring to you and helpful to you, by all means, continue to do that. Um, but, anyway... Hanging in there? Ready to go? All right, buckle up, buttercup. Here we go. Let's take a look at this next uh, section here. We're going to look at the Book of Mormon now. And um, to start with, I want to throw this passage up here. And can we just read it together? Let's read this all together out loud. But in your hearts... All right. Very good. Notice it doesn't say sometimes be prepared. Occasionally be prepared. It says what? Always, Always be prepared. So that's why we have to know things. We have to have certain things kind of settled in our own minds. And here's the advantage that you have as a Christian. The Holy Spirit will speak for you. Do you realize that? The Holy Spirit will give you insight, will give you ideas, will give you thoughts that will allow you to speak and say things that you're going, whoa, that's wild. I've had those moments where I was in a conversation with somebody and I said th something, I went, have you ever had that moment where I went, I can't, that wasn't mine. A lot of times when I'm preaching, I'll be preaching and I'll be going, and when I'm done, someone will say, you were talking right to me, and I go, that wasn't me. That was the Holy Spirit. If you sense the preacher speaking right to you, that's the Holy Spirit speaking to you through that man, using those words. I can actually tell you there are times when I get done preaching, I don't even remember what I said. And someone will say, you said that, and I'll go, what? You know, that's how I know that I'm in the Spirit as well. For those of you who are going to one day be preachers and speakers and teachers and stuff, when you get in that moment where, where the Holy Spirit is driving what you're doing, it is very cool. And you often will go walk away going... I don't even remember what I just said, but that was kind of interesting. That was cool because of the response. Well, the Book of Mormon, and here we have right here, claims to be another testament of who? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. And that's the reason we have to know what the Book of Mormon is about. All right? I would encourage you after this session, every one of you, to go ahead and read the Book of Mormon. Because I think after this session, you're going to be prepared well enough that by the time you get down to the end and you see that little promise, now I'm going to tell you right now, up front, it's not exactly great reading. If you want something to kind of put you to, to sleep at night, it might be something to maybe you know, have there by the table. But uh, it's not exactly the greatest reading. Um, many Mormons will even say this. Uh, when, they, when they actually read the Bible, you know, they've been reading the King James Version, and the King James Version, can we just admit, is a hard version to read. It is a hard version to read. So when they get a version that's a little bit more easy to read, and they go, whoa, I've never read it that way before. I never saw it in that way. It's so much easier to understand. It just, it just blows up for them, and they start to, they start to really um, to see it. Because the Book of Mormon itself is hard to read. And, is it written like in the style of King James? Yeah, it has that. We're going to see that here in a moment. I'm going to actually take you right into the Book of Mormon and show you some of the issues with it. When, in the majority of my conversations with Mormons, as I kind of dive into it and talk with them, here's what I've learned. In general, there are exceptions, but in general, most Mormons don't read the Bible. They say, you saw that video, we read the Bible, they don't read the Bible. They read the Book of Mormon. And then they read what their, their bishop or their, their other leaders will write about the Bible. But they themselves don't read the Bible, you know. That's just been my, my, my own perception as well as experience. Well, just like we watched, um, 
watched a little video to introduce us to the Mormon Church, I want to go back and watch another one of these. They call it simply, simply uh, videos uh, to understand the Book of Mormon. Here's what they say, the Mormons say about the Book of Mormon. What is the Book of Mormon? Where did it come from? And who is this Mormon fellow? This is the Book of Mormon. Made simple. The Book of Mormon is a volume of ancient scripture similar to the Bible. The Bible tells the story of the ancient inhabitants of the Middle East, and the Book of Mormon tells the story of the ancient inhabitants of the Americas. The Book of Mormon begins with the account of a prophet named Lehi, who lived in Jerusalem around 600 BC. God warned Lehi in a dream that Jerusalem would be destroyed because of the wickedness of the people. Lehi gathered a small group, including his family, and fled into the wilderness. With God's protection and guidance, this group crossed the Arabian desert, built a ship, and sailed to the American continent. Shortly after arriving, conflict within the group caused them to split into two rival factions, the Nephites and the Lamanites. As time passed, the Nephites and the Lamanites grew into great civilizations, God called prophets among these people, just as he did in Jerusalem. These prophets, such as Nephi, Jacob, Mosiah, and Alma, prophesied of Christ. They also recorded a history of the people on plates of brass and gold. Their writings cover historical, political, and military events. They also contain sacred revelations given by God to the inhabitants of the Americas. Most importantly, their revelations testify of Jesus Christ. Around 34 AD, a prophet named Nephi recorded the account of Christ's visit to the American continent shortly after his death and resurrection in Jerusalem. Christ stayed with the people for a time, teaching them, healing their sick and wounded, and organizing his church just as he had done in Israel. After his ascension, the people were righteous for a time, and there was peace between the Nephites and the Lamanites. Several hundred years later, the people fell into wickedness. A great battle was fought between the Nephites and the Lamanites in which the Nephite civilization was entirely destroyed. Shortly before this destruction, a Nephite prophet named Mormon compiled the writings of all the prophets into a single narrative, engraving it on plates of gold. He later passed this record on to his son Moroni, who would be the last living warrior among the Nephites. Following the great battle, Moroni fled northward to escape the Lamanites, and eventually arrived in what we now know as upstate New York. Before his death, Moroni buried the ancient record in a hill called Camorra, Meanwhile, the Lamanite civilization continued to grow. Today, we know them as the principal ancestors of the American Indians. Approximately 1,400 years later, Moroni appeared as an angel to a young man named Joseph Smith and disclosed the location of the buried plates. Joseph retrieved these plates and through the power of God, translated them from Reformed Egyptian into the English language. This book was published in 1830 as the Book of Mormon, another testament of Jesus Christ. The term Mormons is a nickname used to describe members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints because of their belief in the Book of Mormon and their use of it as a companion scripture to the Bible. All right, that's it. What do you think? Yeah, I'm actually glad you caught that. I wasn't, you know, the, the, the original language that he translated out was Reformed Egyptian. And he translated it into English. That, 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 that language never existed. There's not a linguist, linguist on the planet, other than maybe a Mormon linguist, who would argue that there was once a Reformed Egyptian language. There was either Egyptian or there wasn't Egyptian, a Reformed Egyptian. But they claim it was some form of Reformed Egyptian, which also doesn't make sense when you think about it. These, these plates, why would they, this is a Jewish family. Okay, remember the story. This is Jews who leave Jerusalem before it's going to be destroyed. Remember the story of Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and the destruction of Jerusalem, 586 B.C. So these are Jews that basically get the message, get out before Jerusalem gets destroyed, and they go over to the Americas, somehow with technology that doesn't even exist today, somehow building a ship that no one's ever tried to go across that, that part of the world with a ship, and knowing, and knowing even to go. So, of course, they would say that the, Holy, the Holy Ghost led them across, I suppose. But then they go over there uh, and, and start a new civilization. But they're Jews. 
why would they be carrying, ref why would they write their, their language? You, if, it would make more sense if they wrote it in Hebrew, right? At least to the story, they wrote it in Hebrew. The other problem you're going to have is, remember they have, there's two sons. His name's Laman and Nephi. That's this, so you got this, this, the father, and he has two sons, Laman and Nephi, and basically these two sons just fight each other. You got a brother that you fight with each other, you know, like that. My brother and I, we just fought cats and dogs, okay? But one was good, one was bad. The Nephites were good, the Lamanites were bad. They be, basically have families, both families are like the, the Hatfields and the McCoys, they fight each other, all right? Then they become great cities, then they become great cultures, and pretty soon they're fighting each other. Where's all that archaeological evidence? Well, that's where we're going to, yeah, that's, that's, that's a great question to ask. But, but anyway, they're going to fight to the point where the Lamanites eventually are going to totally exterminate the Nephites. And then they're going to become, these Lamanites then are going to somehow morph into what we call the, the American Indian today. So all the Indian tribes of the, you know, the Sioux, the Cheyenne, the Cherokee, all the Indian tribes of America are basically of Jewish descent. You hear me? Yeah. There's not an anthropologist on the planet that would believe that. Yeah. Look like they were That's interesting. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I, I didn't look at their wives that close. <laughs> I saw a question over here. All right. Okay. Yeah. So it, it, the story itself has, has issues. Um, let's, um, let's look at this, um, this book for a moment. And let's just look at what, uh, first of all, Joseph Smith says about his own book. The Book of Mormon, obviously an account written by the Hand of Mormon upon plates that were taken from the plates of Nephi. Okay, so Nephi was the, was the original one that wrote these things down, and Mormon compiled them, and then they were buried. Joseph Smith, Jr., upon completing this book, in the opening section to the Book of Mormon, you can read this particular phrase. I told the brethren that the Book of Mormon was the most correct of any book on earth, and the keystone of our faith, and man would get nearer to God by abiding by its precepts than any other book. Let that just for a moment sink in. Most correct book on the planet. See, that's a claim. We call those truth claims. That's a truth claim. Most correct of any book on the planet. What other book might there be on the planet that might be even closely correct? The Bible. Yeah. That's just the words he used. That's the word he used. That's the words he used. Um, but he claimed himself it was the most correct of any book on the planet, which is a truth claim, which is when I come around to my Mormon friends, I show them this, and they, they know it's right there. You can, I actually have them open up their own book of Mormon and read that, and they, they know it's there. It's the most correct book. I said, I said, but you have a problem with the Bible, right? Because they believe the Bible is only correct insofar as it's translated correctly. That's how they get away from all the Bible stuff here. The Book of Mormon, however, is the most correct book. And we're going to find out that it's full of inaccuracies and um, falsehoods. Here's something else that's interesting. This is from um, uh, another uh, one of the, um, uh, let me see who it is. It's one of the, uh, Orson Pratt is his name. Uh, he wrote a book called The Divine Authenticity of the Book of Mormon. This is from 1850, so this is fairly early on. Orson Pratt, he writes this, and he argues, he makes this statement. If the Book of Mormon is false, it is one of the most cunning, wicked, bold, deep-laid impositions ever palmed upon the world, calculated to deceive and ruin millions who will sincerely receive it as a work of God. He's laying down a truth claim. He's basically saying, if it is in any way false then that's a bald lie, a wicked lie. It's you know, deep laid imposition. He goes on to say, the nature of the message of the Book of Mormon is such that if true, no one can be saved and reject it. And if false, no one can possibly be saved and... And I say amen to that. I say amen to that. What we need to do now is compare the Bible to the Book of Mormon. If after rigid examination, it, the Book of Mormon, be found in imposition, it should be extensively what? Published to the world. Published to the world as such. 
The evidences and arguments on which the imposter was detected should be clearly and illogically stated, and those who have been sincerely and unfortunately deceived, which would be the Mormons, may perceive the nature of the deception and be what? Reclaimed, brought back to orthodoxy. This is a Mormon who is speaking. <laughs> and those who continue to publish the delusion may be exposed in silence. I hold in my hands a book by E.D. Howe called Mormonism Unveiled. It's a book that is written in 1834. 1834. Here's the title of it. Mormonism Unveiled, or a faithful account of that singular imposition and delusion from which its rise to the present time with sketches of the characters of its propagators and a full detail of the manner in which the famous Golden Bible, the Book of Mormon, was brought before the world to which are added inquiries into the probability that the historical part of the said Bible was written by one Solomon Spaulding. Basically, he's going to make an argument that, that the Book of Mormon, the history of it, isn't even written, it isn't even divine. It was already written by somebody else in his time. Um, and it, it basically was, and Solomon Spaulding wrote his thing to be a romance novel, not a, not a Bible. Uh, but this was written in, 1880, in 1834. Was that 16 years before this guy wrote these words? There were already books that were coming out saying the Book of Mormon is what? False. And this, I mean, if you want to read this, you can actually download this from Google Books today. It cost me probably $50 to buy this particular book for my library, but you can actually download it. And I'll tell you what I'm going to do. If you like these slides, if you want to copy these slides, I will send you a PDF copy of all these slides. Just write to me, rickcromie at gmail.com. I'll send you a PDF of all these slides, and I'll include a link to this particular book so you can download and read for yourself. You know, make it easy for you. Hmm? This book is called Mormonism Unveiled, all right, by E.D. Howe. But if you just want to write to me and say, hey, I want the, I want the, just say I want the slides, I'll be more than happy to send that to you. Yeah. Where is, where is the Golden Bible book? Well, that's, that's the big question, right? Uh, those plates, after uh, Joseph Smith translated them fully, just disappeared. Uh, the, the Mormon answer is that they were taken back into heaven. Okay, so there's no way, and, and this is one of my big arguments, by the way. They will argue over and over again, the Bible is only correct insofar as it's what? Translated. Okay. So I always ask them this question. The Book of Mormon was first translated from Reformed Egyptian into English. And then I ask them the question, how many different languages is the Book of Mormon translated into? And did you see what it was? 110 different translations. So then I would say, well, wouldn't that mean that any version other than the English version, you need to have a little disclaimer saying, the French version of this is only correct insofar as it's what? Translated correctly. Because they can do the same thing. They can incorrectly translate their own work. That's what they're arguing that the Christian church has done with the Bible. I would argue you could do the same thing with your own Book of Mormon. The best translations go back to the original language. Right. Exactly. Yes, sir. A Reformed Egyptian? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's because of the way he translated it. Uh, he was, um, I wish I could go into all of his background. He was someone who was kind of an of a interesting guy. And remember, he's 14 years old when he has the original version. So he's now probably, what, 17 years of age when he's basically given the, the time to start uh, translating. But he had a hat. And he used to look for treasure this way. He was known around Palmyra, New York, as a treasure hunter. In fact, there were a lot of hills already dug, or a lot of holes already dug in the hill Kumara by Joseph Smith. He was constantly looking for gold and for treasure, anything like that that he could sell and make a buck off of. But he had a hat that he had, and he had a stone. He eventually called these stones the Urim and the Thummim. If you know anything about the Old Testament, talk about the Urim and the Thummim were in the Ark of the Covenant. He eventually called them, put them on that level. They weren't. It was just a single stone. He called it a peep stone, all right? But what he would do to find treasure, he'd put that rock at the bottom of his hat and cover his face up with the hat so it was totally dark. And then that, that rock would somehow come to life and show him where treasure was buried, okay? 
Today we would call that a bit occultic in its, in its uh, manner, okay? But back then, he, you know, he, it was known as, as treasure seeking, and, and he called peeps. That's how he translated the Book of Mormon. He would literally look into his hat, and he would have the, the, the brass plates in front of him, or the gold plates in front of him, which, by the way, would have weighed a lot. The, the, for him to carry the Book of Mormon in gold, it would, there's no way. It would, take, it would have taken a wagon with horses to carry that out of there. But he would, he would look into his hat, and then when the line was correct, he would see the line, he would write the line down. This is according to his testimony. He'd write the line down, and he'd look back in there. If the line was gone, it would go on to the next line to be interpreted. If the line was still there, he had to get it correct before he could go on. So it was kind of a very interesting way of translating. Uh, but anyway, yeah. Book of Mormon is, um, well, I tell you what, let's see if we can hold that. I don't know how many pages it is, but we're, in a moment I'm going to show you the breakdown of it, okay? Let me also hit, the Book of Mormon isn't the only uh, divine work that they have. They have four standard works when you look at it. The Bible, obviously, King James Version again, um, version is, is what they hold. The Book of Mormon, okay, these are their, 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 their two primary works, but they also have two other works. They have what's called the Doctrine and Covenants and the Pearl of Great Price. Here's what's interesting. The Book of Mormon, when you look at the theology of the Book of Mormon, it's actually fairly orthodox. If, if you're, I mean, it even talks about God being three in one. It actually has a little bit of a trinity. There's one verse in there you could argue is a trinity version of God. Uh, but it, it's the way, you could probably convert somebody to to Christianity through the Book of Mormon. It has, the theology is not all that askew. It's not that bad. What's bad about it is the history and all the other stuff that go along with it. Where the Mormon church went crazy, where they went offline, really, or veered off, was with the Doctrine and Covenants. This is where they get into things like there are many gods out there. They talk about uh, uh, levels of heaven and stuff that's not even in the Bible. Baptisms for the dead. It's in the Doctrines and Covenants and uh, the Pearl of Great Price. Then um, if you put all four together, of course, you can get this book. I actually have found one of these once. I found, I found one of these in a Christian church. I said, can I have that? And they said, sure, you can have it. We don't want it. it, was, it was, they, they, they have all, all of them all in one nice big package. Uh, the Bible, the Book of Mormon, Dr. Covenants, and Pearl of Great Price. But um, anyway, they believe in those four standard works, but they also believe in what's called continuing revelation. And what that means is that they accept the words of Mormon prophets as well. So they have a living prophet at the head of their church. Just like the Catholic Church has a pope, they have a living prophet. And that living prophet, when he speaks, it's authoritative. It was a living prophet who in 1890 said that polygamy was wrong. Wrong. Even though Brigham Young had said it was the only way. We'll see this momentarily. It's the only way for you to enter into the celestial kingdom is for you to, to be polygamous. The only way to, be, to reach the highest level of heaven is to, is to actually practice polygamy in 1890 because Utah wanted to be a state and the government, U.S. government said you cannot practice polygamy and be a state. We're not going to let that happen. That's illegal. We don't want that to happen. So suddenly the living prophet says, oh yeah. Oh yes, absolutely. Uh, it's, now, it's now outlawed. It's, it's not something we want to do. Uh, they made it sound in that video earlier that uh, polygamy is not practiced today or not. It's, it's, um, it is practiced, what they call the FLDS, Fundamental Latter-day Saints still practice it. Uh, did, did you see the show or know of the show Big Love? He mentioned, they mentioned that. Uh, there was a, there's a show on uh, TLC called Sister Wives. Uh, it's a reality show. Occasion. Um, but uh, this continuing revelation is interesting because in 1978 they had another revelation. Up till 1978, if you were a black American, you were in trouble. Black Americans could not hold the priesthood in the Mormon church. And if you don't hold the priesthood, you basically cannot move on into heaven. But they were going into uh, a lot of countries now where there were blacks. And so they wanted to, you know, they had to do something about this. The reason why they didn't want, the reason why blacks could not hold the priesthood before 1978 was because they believed that up in heaven, 
Jehovah God, they call him Elohim, is, is having celestial sex with his wives. And they're producing spirit babies. Okay, we'll get into this next hour. It gets really wild. Okay, have you heard this before though? Some of you may have heard this before. Ba that's what they believe is going on right now on a planet called Kolob. Maybe I just ought to introduce it. There's a planet called Kolob. Elohim, Father God, the Heavenly Father, is with his wife or wives. That's why they have to have multiple wives. Is producing all these spirit children. Now, some of the spirit children, for when they came to populate earth, some of the spirit children rebelled. And they believe that Jesus and uh, Lucifer, Satan, are actually brothers. That's another thing to keep in mind. They're brothers. Okay? And they both had a plan of salvation to save the world. Lucifer had a plan to save the world. Jesus had a plan to save the world. And, and by the way, what I'm mentioning to you, this is not the stuff you really want to talk about with your Mormon friends. Because they're, they're going to they're gonna go, first of all, we're, a lot of them have not themselves got this into this deep of theology. But if you go to Brigham Young and study theology, the Book of Mormon, and Mormon theology, this is what you get. But they, they basically had an argument between Mormon Jesus and Mormon Satan. <laughs> and God says, Jesus, you will be the one who will get to go and deal with and give the plan of salvation. Satan, you can't. And because of that, Satan rebelled. That's how the rebellion of Satan happened. And a third of the spirit children rebelled with him. And they became, they were born then, these spirit children, because of the rebellion against Elohim the Father, they were born into black families. They were born as black babies. This is why they could not hold the priesthood. Okay, because they were actually evil spirit children to begin with. The reason, and that's why I, don't, I want you to know that up front so you understand the theology. This is why Mormons have big families, by the way. Because Mormons tend to be white families. And white was where the, the best children all went. All the good spirit children would go to white. So they want to have as many babies as possible so these spirit children from El Elohim will have a good Mormon family to go to. They don't want them born to like a Lyndon Rick. Lyndon and Rick are nice, but we don't want... We don't want these spirit children going to a Lyndon Rick. We prefer they go to a, a Ben and Kayla Taylor. That's my, my, uh, my son-in-law and uh, daughter-in-law. Does that make sense? Maybe it doesn't. It's crazy, but um, it's there. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Yes. That has ever been put on mankind or something like that. Yeah. Right? Um, in 1 Corinthians 11, 13, when the verse is following, it talks about how angels, or I mean, or how demons or the servants of Satan can appear as angels of light. Of Christ yeah. or angels of light. Yeah. Didn't Joseph Smith genuinely believe that an angel came to him and gave him this revelation? Oh, yeah. Do you think he was like just totally off the rock? I think, I, think I think he totally believed it in the end. But, you know, then again, I don't know. You can be sincerely crazy and believe some stuff. I mean, uh, I, I, I don't want to go there. I won't go there. I mean, there's about our culture day. I mean, what we believe about gender. How do you, you know? change that doctrine? You know? yeah. How do you change that doctrine about, that, the black, about the black people? Well, what happened was in 1978, that's where I was going, the living prophet basically said that all the spirit children, I think this is where he went, okay, theologically. All the spirit children that could be born to black families have already been born, so we don't have to worry about that anymore. All blacks now can come to, this, to the priesthood. So it's now okay. So he changed, the, he changed the revelation. But before 1978, if you were black, you could not hold the priesthood in the Mormon church. I wonder how many people they're teaching that they're yeah. black or know all about it. Yeah. Oh, if you were if you were a black Mormon before 1978, yeah, that's a good question. I, I I don't know if I want to even go there and give a qualified answer on that. That's that. See, these are, this is where you get into graduate level Mormon theology stuff, and uh, you know, th and that's also a problem because unlike the Bible, you don't have the Book of Mormon doesn't talk anything about any of this. 
Even the Doctrine and Covenants doesn't speak about this. A lot of these things that we're talking about, like what I just mentioned, the Elohim and all that stuff, that came from revelations by Brigham Young years later. See, they believe in continuing revelation. So this type of stuff you're not, that I just shared with you about Elohim and on Kolob and all this spiritual stuff, that actually happened through act other revelations that came after the Doctrines and Covenants were done. It's continuing revelation. Um, one thing to keep in mind, let me hit through a few more of these, and then I want to I show you some stuff from the Book of Mormon. It's a serious offense to claim God didn't say, that God said something that he didn't. Uh, the Bible teaches that, obviously. And before Mormon scripture can be given any credibility, it must agree with what God has already revealed in the Bible. Can we just start with that one? If Mormon scripture can be given any, before we can give any credibility to it, at all, we must, it must agree with what God has already revealed in the Bible. So, let me take you to that test. Remember I told you, if you read the Book of Mormon, you're going to get to the end of it, and in Moroni chapter 10, verses 3 through 4, you're going to find this verse. Behold, I would exhort you that when you shall read these things, it will be, if it be the, what? Wisdom of God, in God, that ye should read them, that ye should would remember how merciful the Lord hath done, been unto the children of men, from the creation of Adam, even down until the time that ye shall receive these things, and ponder it in your hearts. And when ye shall receive these things, I would exhort you that ye would, what? Ask God, the Eternal Father, in the name of Christ, if these things are not true. And if ye shall ask with a sincere heart, with real intent, having faith in Christ, he will manifest the truth of it unto you by the power of the Holy Ghost. And this is where they claim about, if you've ever heard this idea of a burning in the bosom, you know, if you will just ask this, if you really question, and so th they will ask you, have you, have you come across this passage? You know, and if you've read the Book of Mormon, you can say, yeah, actually I have, you know, and I've read it, and i was told it was false. What, what did you hear? And they're going to say, well, I heard it was, for us, it was true. I said, well, then one of us has got it wrong then, right? The Holy Spirit's either lying to one of us. Either he's lying to me or he's lying to you. We've got to figure this out. So if you start it with that type of a gentle way, let's, let's, let's start a journey together and maybe study it out. Maybe that works. It seems to work with me. So the Book of Mormon, let me just kind of show you what the Book of Mormon looks like. This is the inside of the Book of Mormon as far as the actual books. You're going to find that you have the Plates of Mormon and the Sealed Plates. They were not translated. But the Book of Mormon itself that was translated are those gray books on the other side. First and Second Nephi, Jacob, Enos, Jerem, Omni, Words of Mormon, Lehi, Mosea, Alma, Helaman, Third Nephi, Fourth Nephi, Mormon, Eth Ether, and Moroni. Okay? And um, so let's, let's just look at the problems that we have with the Book of Mormon here. First of all, archaeological problem. Lamanites are cursed. I've already talked about that, right? They were cursed and they became the forefathers of the Indians in America, which suggests they're of Jewish uh, descent. Well, when you look at the map, you know, you can kind of see where they're all at. They're all down there in, the, in, in Mexico, Central America, Northern South America. That's kind of where they're at. And they're going to migrate. They're going to migrate up. That's going to be a problem. There is not an anthropologist on the planet that would agree that the American Indian, that the Indian, even the central, you know, the, they're saying the Aztecs, the, the Incas, the Mayans, they were also what, Jewish descent. Anthro now. Yeah, anthrop anthropologically, they have a problem with that. You can't do that. They also have a geographical problem. I love this one. This is probably my, one of my favorites. The Book of Mormon names cities, mountains, seas, other geographical locations that do not exist. If you were to go to uh, Brigham Young University and take uh, what they call Mormonism 101, you know, just like we have a Christianity 101, a lot of times you go to Christian University, they would take a Mormon 101 class. In that class, you get what's called the Doctrines and Covenants and the Book of Mormon Student Manual. All right? It's a student manual. It's a big manual like this. Um, in, in Boise, where I live, we have a lot of um, Mormon thrift shops, and I like to go in there and I can find these student manuals. The older student manual, the newer student manual does not include what I'm going to show you. They've taken it out, in other words. But the newer student manual, or the older one that I, that I got way back in the day, had this map. 
And notice what it says. Areas and cities in the Book of Mormon, possible locations as mentioned in the scriptural writings. So just like if you go to the back of the Bible, you see maps of Palestine, and you see where Bethlehem's at, and Jerusalem's at, and you know, all these different places, Nazareth. You know, they have their own map. This is what their world looked like, according to the Book of Mormon. That's their map. Notice all the mountains, all the towns that are mentioned. See, the Book of Mormon mentions all these things. Well, here's what's interesting. See this little thing down here? Okay? There is a little note at the bottom. This is, a, this is from the map. I'm going to highlight that. Okay? This is what it says in the Book of Mormon student map from page 286. Quote, Possible comparative relationships for use of the sites mentioned in the Book of Mormon based on internal evidences. No effort should be made to identify points on this map with any existing geographical location. <laughs> this is their own book, folks. And this is the land, of, this is supposedly the land that's below America? Yeah. This is their own book. Can you imagine in your Bibles, looking at the, the map of Palestine, where it says Bethlehem and Nazareth and Jerusalem, and then down at the bottom having a note saying, you know, don't compare this with any existing map because, uh, you know, it's not, it's not accurate. We can compare, right? We can compare. We know where Bethlehem's at. We know where Jerusalem's at. We can compare. Our maps are accurate. The Book of Mormon map cannot be proven. <laughs> Does it? Yeah. Yeah, is there in Hemla? Yeah, sure. Here's another one that's a problem. The linguistic problem. There are multiple language errors in the Book of Mormon that create concern and skepticism. How many of you have actually tried to read the Book of Mormon? Anybody actually got into it and tried to read it all? Okay, when you get into it and try to read it, it's, it's really, as I just read to you, well, let me read to you a little bit from 1 Nephi, chapter 7. This is the opening chapter. If you were a Mormon, you'd have to read this all the time, so keep this in mind. And it came to pass that when I, Nephi, had spoken these words unto my brethren, they were angry with me. And it came to pass that they did lay their hands upon me, and for behold, they were exceedingly wroth. And they did bind me with cords, for they sought to take me away my life, that they might leave me in the wilderness to be devoured by wild beasts. But it came to pass that I prayed unto the Lord, saying, O oh Lord, please, according to my faith, yada, yada. It came to pass, it came to pass, it came to pass, it came to pass. I actually highlight all the came to passes there. That's an that's a interesting little linguistic thing that the, that the King James Version used. Uh, it came to pass was a phrase that was in the King James Version. And a lot of people at that, in that time frame would often try to imitate and mimic the King James Version because it was the Bible. And they would use phrases like it came to pass. The Book of Mormon overuses it. I can show you passages in the Book of Mormon where every single verse starts with the phrase, it came to pass, it came to pass, it came to pass. That's a linguistic problem, okay? Because that shows that this wasn't written by a very intelligent person, okay? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mentioned to you this, this book by E.D. Howe, Mormonism Unveiled. Um, look at Enos 121. I want you just to read Enos 121 and tell me what the problem is. And it came to pass that the people of Nephi did till the land and raise all manner of grain and fruit and flocks of herds and flocks of all manner of cattle of every kind and goats and wild goats and also many horses. What's the problem there? Think about that. Flocks, Flocks of herds. What, 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 what is a bunch of birds called? A flock. What's a bunch of cattle called? A herd. A herd. But have you ever heard of flocks of herds? What? It's their own Bible. Incidentally, there have been over 4,000 changes in the Book of Mormon since 1830. You know, 4,000 changes in the Book of Mormon. And we're not talking just small changes. We're talking actual name changes things that were direct contradictions. But every now and then, you know, I just bring up these. I bring up these type of things. Say, Help me understand what a flock of herd is. What's a flock of herd? And, you know, you, you do it gently and with respect, but what you want to do is plant the seed of doubt. Okay? Here's another one. Look at Jacob 7.27. And I, Jacob, I'm not going to read the whole verse. And I, Jacob, <laughs> saw that I must soon go down to my grave, yada, yada, yada. Brethren, adieu. What's the problem there? It's French. This was supposedly translated into English from what language? Egyptian. Reformed Egyptian. There was no French back and that's what I ask him. I say, well, how did a French word get into the Book of Mormon? I don't understand. See, that's not even an English word. 
If he said, brethren, goodbye, okay, maybe that would be more accurate, but adieu. Or how about this one, Alma 7.10. This will, this will blow your socks off. And behold, he, talking about Jesus, shall be born of Mary at Jerusalem, which is the land of our forefathers, she being a virgin, a precious and chosen vessel, yada, yada, yada. Where is he born at? Where was Jesus born? He was born in Bethlehem, not Jerusalem. That's an, that's, a, that's an actual mistake that's never been corrected. No one believes. You know? Yeah. How about this? A quote from Orson Pratt, again from Evidences of the Book of Mormon. This guy looks like a winner of a guy anyway, but uh, uh, he says this, this generation has more than 1,000 times the amount of evidence to demonstrate and forever establish the divine authenticity of the Book of Mormon than they have in favor of the Bible. See, he's throwing down the gauntlet there. I say, bring it on. Bring it on. I can show you archaeological evidence. I can show you anthropolog anthropological evidence. I can show you linguistic evidence. Let me show you one more. How about archaeological? The Book of Mormon is about two great civilizations, but there's no evidence of these great civilizations. All right? Listen to the Smithsonian Institution. The Smithsonian Institution issued an official statement in 1996 and again in 1998 that it considered the Book of Mormon to be, quote, a religious document and not a scientific guide. They do not make the same statement about the Bible, by the way. Biblical archaeology, the Smithsonian Institute has confirmed, is valid for archaeological research. The National Geographic Society in 1998 sent a letter to the Institute for Relig Religious Research stating, quote, archaeologists and other scholars have long probed the hemisphere past and the society does not know of anything found so far that has substantiated the Book of Mormon. There's no archaeological support for this book. And by the way, remember that, that guy that I called the Paul of the Apostle? Paul the Apostle of the Mormon Church who took me underneath to see all the Mormon archaeology? As he was laying it out, he says, this, this is the evidence we had. And I leaned over and I looked at it. And it even said right there on it, Incan, Mayan, Aztec. <laughs> so I said to him, I said, but this is Incan. This is Mayan. This is Aztec. And he said, it's time to go. <laughs> you know? It's time to go. Yeah. I, I guess I wasn't supposed to read the text. But yeah. It's, uh, yeah. But they have no evidence. Even the evidence that they, they try to prove to impress people of it is really actually Incan and Mayan and Aztec, you know, which are civilizations that we have what? Archaeologically explored and have identified. The Book of Mormon asserts specifically that in just one battle near the Hill of Camor in New York State, about 230,000 soldiers were killed on one side alone. By 385 AD, the number of Nephite soldiers killed is estimated to be close to a quarter million people. The Jaredite civilization was likely much larger. The final war that destroyed the Jaredite civilization killed at least two million men, and yet we have absolutely no evidence. You can go down to, the, go down to Tennessee, go down to Pennsylvania, go to any of these places where we've had great, like the Civil War, and you can dig up bullets still, even to this day. You can dig up buttons off of, off of soldiers' clothing. You can dig these things up. There is no evidence for any of this. How about one more? Book of Mormon Archaeology. And we multiplied exceedingly and spread upon the face of the earth. This is actually from Jerem 1.8. We became exceedingly rich in gold and in silver and in precious things, in fine workmanship of wood, buildings, and machinery, and also in iron and copper and brass and steel, making all manners of what? Tools of every kind to till the ground, weapons of war, yea, the sharp-pointed arrow, the quiver, the dart, the javelin, all preparations for war. Where's the evidence? Yeah, but where's the evidence? You know, Indians, Native Americans, we can go and dig up their Indian arrowheads even to this day. We can find those. We can dig up all sorts of, of evidence for these. All right, there are others that I can bring to you, but that's the Book of Mormon in a nutshell. I'm going to stay up here and answer any questions you might have. Thanks for giving me a couple extra minutes again. We'll see you after break. I know it goes by, doesn't it? <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, the battle. That battle. Um, I'd have to think about the Jared. That would have been pre, pre Jesus. No, it would have been post Jesus. Jared, the Jared. Is it the Jaredites? Definitely. Anything Nephi and Lamb is going to be post Jesus. I think the Jaredites was pre Jesus. I, I don't remember. 